Um, yesterday we had a wonderful uh, moment during the memorial service and we praise the Lord for what he did. Uh, beginning today and into the whole month of May, I would like us to pull away from the book of uh, Luke just for the sake of this one month, which is five sermons. I would like us to do a series on the greatness of God the greatness of God. And the theme for this month is going to be Behold your God. Behold your God. It is my prayer that during this month and through this uh, five-part series, we will develop a high view of God. And we will begin to think through the biblical understanding and teaching of God. Uh, in a sense, we have come to a place, or we at times come to a place in the church and in our individual walk, where we somehow lose the high view of God. Somehow we forget and begin to think, well, God is just an abstract, somewhere far away, looking from a distance, perhaps in a telescope, and watching and trying to see what we are trying to figure out about him. I would like us to begin to learn that God is far bigger and far greater than we, in, we can ever think or imagine. We need to begin to develop in our minds and in our hearts the greatness of God. And then when we go out in life out there, whether at work, at home, in our associations with friends and the things that we do, we are able to relate with the with, with, with the greatness of God or with the bigness of God, if there is such a word in English. We need to learn that. At times, we do certain things, we fall into unnecessaries because, simply because of our low view of God. We really view God very low. And so I pray in this month and then in the month that will come, we'll return to the book of Luke. And so for a season, we are going to look at the greatness of God. And uh, we will deliberately focus on looking at some attributes of God. Uh, we'll look at certain attributes of God that point to the greatness of God. And, and, and I don't want us to look at attributes that talk about the acts of God, because it's easy to say, He created. Wow, He's big. But I would like us to look at attributes that point us to his greatness in his very essence, in his very being, and to look at him from that uh, context. And so, this morning I have so much to say, and I will be in a bit of a rush, but I will also be very careful to teach because uh, I'm using today as more of a foundation. I really need to lay the foundation so that we can associate with what we now begin to develop on in understanding who God is. Now let me begin with a conversation. Go with me to the book of Job. Job 38. This is towards the end of the conversation. God has now come on the scene. If you remember the story of the book of Job, Job has been a righteous man, a man who worships God, literally carrying out uh, sacrifices almost weekly. He's carrying out sacrifices not only for the sins of the children, his own sins and the sins of the children, but even the sins that are presumed or he thinks my children can end up doing this or wherever they are, they may have done the following things and so I sacrifice on their behalf. It always reminds me of my father with my elder brothers. There was a time when my father would come home from work. Uh, we were young, we were in primary, and uh, the first thing he would do when he comes, he would uh, whip us. He would give me, myself and my brothers, he would give us five strokes each. Good five ones and then he says go to bed. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. We said, but what's wrong with this man? What have we done? And then he would show up again and he would give us five good ones. Then tomorrow, five good ones. And so my mother was not so happy with that. And she finally said, look, 
but why do you do this to the boys? At times he would wake us up. We would now sleep early, so when he comes back from the club, he finds we are sleeping, he would say, are the boys sleeping? Wake them up. So somebody would come and wake us up and he would give us five strokes and say, now go back to sleep. I was so inhuman as far as we were concerned. Eventually my mother said, no, 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 this is out of line. Why do you, why do you have to whip the boys all the time? And then my father said, I know. Wherever they were playing, someone, one of them must have done something wrong Either they were fighting or he's broken something. There is something wrong they've done. So I'm now spanking them just in case they did something wrong wherever they were. Ah, it was so painful. But um, after growing up, I appreciate that because my father was right. They were wrong things we were doing that the home didn't know. And somehow we broke a window somewhere at somebody's place and we came running and we are home, nobody knows. Somehow we had a fight somewhere. Uh, I still remember my immediate elder brother had a fight somewhere and it was not a good fight and so he came running, he called my other elder brother and we all ran there, I was the youngest. My eldest brother was the strongest and he beat up the guys and we walked back home and got home as if nothing happened. And so my father was right. He would, now he didn't behave like Job. Job was at least sacrificing. For, for us, he was the, it's us, the very sacrifice. So Job, Job was always taking care of that. Now, what I want us to observe is what Job is doing here. Look at how Job, conf uh, God now confronts Job. Job has been defending himself. And I want us to see how God comes to Job. 38 verse 4. Remember we are developing a high view of God and we are laying the foundation of what we'll be learning as we go on. Look at verse 34, chapter 34 verse 4. This is at the tail end of the conversation. The four friends, the three friends, plus Elihu, the young man who is now being used of God to speak. God comes in the whirlwind and is now going to speak to Job. Verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. Now that's God telling Job. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where you... Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, Job. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases, its base, what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut the seas with the doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescri prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you come and no further. And here shall you proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Out of it? it is changed like clay under the seal, that the seal and its fears, features stand out like a garment from the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. God looks at Job in a sense and says, Job, dress up like a man. You have been defending yourself. I mean, Job, you've talked too much. Dress up like a man. Talk to me. Do you know me? Basically, God is saying, Job, do you understand who I am? Do you have any knowledge? Can you comprehend me? Basically, God is telling Job that, were you there? He's saying, I created. Were you there? Do you know who was drawing the blueprint of the universe? 
Do you know the architectural mind behind what, what you see? Do you know who told the sea or the rivers to not go beyond a certain line? I drew the line. They never go. Do you know who sunk the base? Who made the, the bottom part of the sea? Do you have an idea, Job? I mean, Job has been defending himself. Now, obviously, when you hear God speak like this and tell Job, dress up like a man and let's see if you can talk to me and let's see if you really know me, all of us obviously are saying, ah, God, I mean, this is unfair because Job is mortal man. I mean, you are God. How honestly do you challenge him like this? Well, God has the right to challenge him like this. Why? Look at how Job began his conversation. Go to chapter 10. Job and chapter 10. Look at how Job has been talking. Job chapter 10. I loathe myself. I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend against me. Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the designs of thy wicked? Have you eyes of flesh? Do you see as a man sees? Are, you day, are your days as the days of man? Or your years as a man's years, that you seek out my iniquity and search for my sin, although you know that I am not guilty, and there is none to deliver out of your hands. You, your hands fashioned and made me, and now you have destroyed me altogether. Remember that you have made me like clay, and will you return to the dust? Did you not pour out? Did you not pour me out like milk and cradle me like cheese? You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and steadfast love and you care, your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you hide in your heart. I know that this was your purpose. God says, Job, dress up like a man. This is how you defend yourself? Okay, Job. Stand up. Let's have a chat. So Job has already begun defending himself. He's been talking to God and he says, God, why are you doing this to me? You know that I'm innocent. You know that I'm not guilty. And look at how you search for sin in my heart. How you have pressed me in the corner and tried to demonstrate that I have sinned. And Job is saying, no, I have not sinned. God, you're the one who made me. You're the one who put my flesh together. You're the one who gathered me in the way I look. And I know you were doing this for a purpose. And God is going to respond to Job and said, okay, Job, you think you know me. You think you know me. Dress up like a man. Let's have a one-on-one. -on -one. And now Job, at the end, wait. When he hears God speak, we'll not go there. But when he hears God, God speak, when you get to chapter 40, Job falls down and says, I am guilty. I have sinned against God. How dare did I challenge God? He regrets. So friends, I bring this illustration and this conversation before you to show you that God himself tells us who he is. We come most of the time to God with a preconceived mind, assuming we know God, and we measure up God in a certain box, and we draw lines of how far God can go, and how far God can be, and how he should relate to us. And God said, no, 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 my friend, you don't know me. You don't know me. Go to the scriptures and have a right understanding of me. Get to know who I am. And when you know who I am, then you will have a high value or view of me. Then you will say, wait a minute. I thought God was this small, but God is so big. He is so strong. 
He is so mighty that there is nothing that God cannot do. Our Sunday school children tend to sing. And that's what we want to look at. So let's begin firstly by understanding the problem of trying to understand God's nature. Some of the problems that we have in our effort to try to understand God, just like Job in here was assuming all his religious practices, all his sacrifices, all his knowledge. In a sense, Job had the mind that he had conceived. He had this concept and the totality of God known in him. And God says, no, Job, you don't know me. And the same mistake and the same problem, we tend to do that as well. And may I begin by suggesting to you that if we have the right understanding of God, we have the right understanding of the doctrine of God, then we have the central point for much of the rest of our theology. Today we live in a time and age where believers have all kinds of saying and all kinds of claims about God. And the whole truth is because of the nature of their doctrine of God, because of their perception of God, because of their little understanding of God, they have come up with all kinds of theology. They have come up with all kinds of ways to live in their Christian life. And the only truth is they have a small view of God. They have a, a, a very marred doctrine of God. They do not understand what God says about himself and how he communicates about who he is. And if only we can understand, if only we can have that glimpse of who God is. The Bible tells us people like Moses, who had no understanding of who God is, who thought they could come up with a plan which God will adopt and make it his own plan. And he never understood until he met God in the burning bush. And God says, Moses, take off your sandals because where you stand, it's holy ground. And God begins to interrogate and conversate with Moses. And Moses realizes and says, this is God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many others of the old never knew who really God is they determined God based on their religious activities and they assumed this is how much God is until God began to reveal himself. God shows up in the train of his robe and appears before Isaiah and Isaiah cries and says, oh, I'm undone. God appears before Nebuchadnezzar, the great mighty and wicked king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, for the first time, he sees God. He says, I threw three boys in the burning fire, but there seems to appear one who is like the Son of Man. But even when God reveals himself like that, Nebuchadnezzar goes ahead and ridicules God and mocks God and says everything against the God of Daniel until God says, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, you want a test of me. Let's go to the field. And Nebuchadnezzar is taken in the bush and for seven years God makes Nebuchadnezzar to eat grass. And the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar became like an animal. He grew nails and he was eating grass like a cow for seven years. The king himself. And after seven years God restores him back. He comes back into the kingdom and he says truly the God of, Nebuchadnezzar, the God of Daniel is the God we need to worship. It was when he had a glimpse of who God is. Paul, the apostle, was busy pursuing the Christians, trying by all means to destroy the faith as much as he could, and riding on a horse, charging towards the city of Damascus with all the authority to go and get all the Christians like he has been doing in other cities, get them out and kill them. He has been one of those who held the jackets of those who were stoning Stephen the deacon. And now he's going into another city. Guess who he meets along the way? On his horse, he feels like he hits against a, a wall that is invisible. He falls to the ground. He looks and there's a massive light before him. And from the light, he hears the spoken word of God. So, why are you fighting me? 
Why are you kicking against the gods? And Saul says, Who are you, O Lord? I am Jesus whom you are fighting against. And Paul couldn't believe what he was interacting with. It was God himself. And after that incident, God takes Paul into the desert of Arabia. And he stays three years there. We don't know what he's doing with, with, with him in the, in the desert of Arabia. But when he comes back from the desert of Arabia, Paul has seen God. He's nobody else. And he says, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I am willing to die for this God. Many men of old, when God reveals himself to them, many men of old, when they see the magnitude of this great God, and all of a sudden they begin to see themselves as little, tiny, insipiency, wicked human beings that deserve nothing but totally death before this great and awesome God. As though that's not enough, when we walk the path of history, we are told of men who were ready to die. Many, many Christians who accepted to be martyred for Christ. And just by one phrase that they would have said and their lives would have been saved. The emperor would ask them, deny Christ. Say, Jesus is not Lord. And they said, no, Jesus is Lord. We shan't call him otherwise. And they were killed. The Bible tells us of men like Polycarp. Polycarp from the third generation of the Apostle John. Polycarp, he was about 82 years old. He had loved the Lord so much. He had known the greatness of God. They finally arrest Polycarp and they are going to bring to kill him. The story goes that the soldiers who went to carry Polycarp in the chariot were busy pleading with Polycarp. They were saying, Mr. Polycarp, please, you are a good man. We know you fear God. But I mean, when we get there, just, just deny Christ just for that moment so that your life is saved. Polycarp, an 82-year-old man, says, No, my friend, I know this God. He is great and mighty. They get Mr. Polycarp, they tie him on a stake, they're about to burn him. And the story goes that when they tied Polycarp to the staff, and he's there standing and the man who was busy tying him to burn him was weeping and pleading with Polycarp. Because they knew Polycarp as a man who feared God. They knew Polycarp who knew who God is. He had a great high view of this God. The story goes as Polycarp was being tied on that tree to be burnt alive. He said, no my friend, I shan't deny my Christ. The story goes that they set the fire ablaze and Mr. Polycarp began to burn. As he was burning on that tree, he looked up to heaven, he prayed, he claimed to have seen Christ or the Lord in his prayer. And it's, the story goes that his, his intestines opened, his, 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 his blood poured and almost quenched part of the fire and yet he was still worshipping God. He was one of those who was burnt for Christ and took long to die. A man would subject himself to such a death because he understood the greatness of God. Oh, my friends, the reason we run, the reason we cry when we are hurting, the reason we kick against everything that we can, a little suffering, the whole world knows we are suffering, a little hunger, the whole world knows we are hungry, a little loss, the whole world knows we are losing, just a little scratch on us, we complain, we cry, we kick, we say all kinds of things. I'll tell you one thing, we are not like the men of old who understood the greatness of God. And they had a great view of God. And they looked upon their earthly suffering as minor. Peter says it's only for a season. Paul says his grace is sufficient. After praying three times that God would take away the hurt, the pain that was upon his body, the Bible says Paul looked back to God and said, though I'm going through this, his grace is sufficient. When I am weak, then I am strong. 
He would only speak like that because he understood his God was great. Friend, how big is your God? How big is your God in relation to life? How big is your God in relation to what he says about himself? Is your God tiny? Show me your life. Show me the things that you cry about. Show me the experiences of your life and I will show you the magnitude of your God. We need friends to develop a high view of who this God is. And that's why God tells Job, Job, dress up like a man. Do you really know me? Can you evaluate your circumstances and use that to determine who I am? Job, are you out of your mind? Dress up like a man and listen. So many times we think God is, is like a grandfather. He's just like a grandfather who doesn't want to see any one of us hurting. And just like we enjoy, little children enjoy themselves running around a grandfather, somehow we think that's how God is. At other times we think God is like a policeman. He is this spiritual policeman who walks around with a whip looking for who will fall in sin and whip them. Those are some of the kind of views that we have about God. But brethren, there's a need for a correct view of God. There's a need for us to understand who this God is. And then at other times, we have this excessive analysis of God. We have this excessive analysis of God. We come to the word of God and we come to the attributes of God. Guess what we do? We study God in a way like a scientist or a doctor or a surgeon would be carrying out an operation, would be trying to dissect the anatomy of a human being and lay them there and explain every details of this human body or of this body of an animal but yet there is no that relationship with that person they are dissecting it's like we come to the bible as though it's just a mere textbook and we want to know okay god is spirit god is loving god is this and all that and at times we even engage into debates on who god is my friends that's not the way it should be when we are studying God, we are studying God with the idea that he has a personal relationship. And as I am knowing God, I am getting closer with God. In history, we have individuals who, who were, or even now, who are very good at giving you a theological explanation of the attributes of God of the doctrines of the Christian faith they can lay everything so systematic they don't preach like me I'm just noisy but they understand the technicalities and they can break it down so well and they can explain it so well but listen their relationship with that God doesn't exist. They don't have a high view of God. They have quite an information about God, but their personal life does not have a high view of God. That information about God has done nothing in their hearts. My friends, lest we look down on scholars and theologians and say, oh, maybe it's those. No, I can even bring it home among us. There is so much that we know about God. We own Bibles right now. We own Christian materials right now. We own information. We own applications on our phones. We have so much information around us. But our lives have extremely a low view about God. What our lives say about God when people read our lives, they can't read God. When they hear what we say, they can't hear God. Why? Because we have a low view about God. Why? Because our relationship with this great God is questionable. 
I mean, think of a man and a woman who get in love. Ever heard of a man or a woman who claims they love this lady or they love this man and they want to get into a relationship and then they go into marriage? Ever met one who only gives you just that general explanation about the lady? Do you know what I mean? They speak far removed from her. Eh? That, 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 that lady, she's beautiful. She's tall. She's short. She smiles. She laughs. She talks. And then, and then you say, oh, so is that the one you are, you are in a relationship, you are going to get married? Yes. Oh, okay. She lives there. That's her sister and brother. So today we have a date, and you go to the mall, you find them seated together, and he's watching at her. Oh, she drinks like that. Oh, she even eats. Ah, I think this is good information. I think you would agree with me that's a weird man, right? Sorry, brother, if you're here. But ask any man or any woman. They will tell you. When they get in love, they have all this to say. Oh, did you see her? Hmm. Ah, God has made it. <laughs> Me, I want to bury her next month. But the family says next year. Can you imagine? No, 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 no. This is unfair. No, today we had a date. Yeah, you should have heard her talk. Oh, she smiled. Mm. When she's talking, so, Yeah, she, just her talk. Even the other way around, you see those sisters. How they express themselves about the ones they love. Now, you all look sad and dry as if, Pastor, those happen only on you. I think that's what it was between you and your wife. It was far more than that. My point is this. A relationship between a person, between two people, as we get to know information about them, we get closer to them. We finally reach a point and say, you know what? I have known enough that I'm ready to get married with this person. You go on their phone, when they open their wallpaper is the picture of this person. Whatever you see, they're throwing things on the, on, the, on, the, on the social media. It's all about this person. And already you are knowing that hmm, something is going on here. Friends, when we study God, and when we, began, we begin to understand and develop a high view of God, that view should very quickly draw us to just love this God, to know Him more, to want to be with Him, to always spend our time in His Word, to want to talk about Him, to want to engage everybody around us about this God. Like I said earlier on, may I suggest further to you that if this is not happening in your life, either you are backslidden, either you are still very young in the Lord, or you have a low view of who God is. Because He doesn't affect you in any way. And if that's the case, probably you may not even be a Christian. Because the very knowledge of God, as God continues to reveal himself to his children, his children begin to grow closer to him, begin to love him, begin to want to talk about him, begin to want to always be with him, begin to want to make those next to them just know this God is great and mighty. Secondly, we need to understand, therefore, if we are to know this God, we must understand the things that will make us know Him. 
And these are the things the Bible or the theologians call attributes. And I want us to quickly understand the nature of attributes. The nature of attributes. When we speak of the attributes of God, we are making reference to those qualities. The qualities that constitute who God is or what he is. The very character of his nature. We are not making reference here to merely acts such as creation, guiding, preserving, and all those. No, we are talking about himself in his essence. What is God? So when we come to these attributes, let me make this known to you. The attributes, which simply means the qualities or the character. Um, in school, those of you in secondary school, you will remember that you were learning, or you are learning, if the syllabus is still the same as the way I had it, that you, there is a topic that you would learn something like the characteristics of a plant. You remember that? That should be grade 8 or grade 9. The character, characteristics of a plant. So we'll draw a plant and we'll say a plant has roots. A plant has a stem. A plant has branches. A plant has leaves. A plant, some plants produce fruit. Some plants don't produce fruit. Remember those characteristics? So if you were to go out after that science class and you begin to look at something set before you, you begin to say, oh, so these are the roots. Oh, so this is the stem. Ah, these are the branches. Ah, these are the leaves. Guys, I've found a plant. This is a plant. Do you get the idea? So, by looking at the characteristics of this thing, which you have been taught, you conclude that this is a plant. Same applies when you come to the characteristics of an animal. You can mention any particular animal. And if you don't know it, they'll bring it and they begin to show you the characteristics. It has legs, it has a skin, it has fur or feathers, it has teeth or a beak, it has eyes. And after they finish, you'll be able to know that, ah, this is a dog and this is a bird because of the characteristics and also furthermore the things that it does when we come to God in a similar fashion the characteristics of God or the qualities of God are what we call attributes and so if we want to know God and have an understanding of who God is we go to the Bible because God reveals himself and he begins to reveal himself through certain characteristics. And we begin to say, ah, God is, oh, God does, oh, God lives how this long. And when we see those characteristics, which are called attributes, which are the qualities, then we conclude and say, ah, this is God. And because this is God, he now asks me to relate with him in such a way. So that's that word attributes, okay? So when we talk about the qualities of God, there are three things that you have to know. Number one, the attributes are qualities of the entire Godhead. Entire Godhead. Who is in the Godhead? There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we say the attributes of God, we are talking about the attributes that are for the whole Godhead. The Son is the same, the Father is the same, and the Holy Spirit. There is no way Jesus will have these attributes that the Father doesn't have, or the Holy Spirit will have certain attributes that the Father doesn't have, or the Father will have certain attributes that Jesus and the Holy Spirit doesn't have. If that happens, then it means we have three gods. But that doesn't happen. The Bible says all the characteristics of God are going to be entirely upon the whole Godhead. That's the first thing. The second thing, the attributes are permanent qualities. It is not attributes that will be gained and lost. Today God was loving, but tomorrow he ceases to be loving. The other day God was, was, was a God of anger or wrath, but he has ceased to be a God of anger or wrath. 
The attributes of God are permanent. He is forever this. So, if you were to find a plant which no longer has roots, it no longer has leaves, it no longer has a stem, and somebody comes to you and says, this is a plant, you will refuse. And if he says, no, once upon a time when it was growing, it used to have roots, but it stopped having roots, now it just grows without roots. You'll be able to say, you know what, then it ceased to be a plant. But it can't happen for a plant because the moment it doesn't have, then it is not. It is not that it was once upon and now it's not. With God, it's a similar sense. There's no way God can be a God of love in one century and in the next century they see him and say, no, he used to be a God of love, but in this century he's no longer a God of love. Then that means he ceases to be God. So the attributes of God the qualities of God are permanent. They can't be for just a mere season. Thirdly, the attributes are inseparable from God's being or essence. What does that mean? They are inseparable, meaning there are times when we look at attributes in the sense that he is a God of love, isolated, is a God of Wrath, isolated, is a God of peace, isolated. He is omnipresent, isolated. The, the attributes of God are not separated. God is consistent. Like Ephesians says, the attributes of God are the multifacets of God himself. It is the way God reveals himself. He wants us to know when we look at him from this angle, we see the love side of him. When he turns around, we look at him from this angle, we see he's the God of grace. When he turns around, we look at him from this angle, we see him as a God of wrath. When he turns around, we look at him from this angle, he is God the creator. From this angle, he is God the omnipotent. From this angle, he is God the omniscient. And all those, those attributes are together they are not inseparable they are all attached and making reference to this one same god and here's where it becomes very interesting no one attribute will be perceived greater and better than this attribute because if it was that then he ceases to be god then one attribute in him must grow to arrive at the other attribute but it never happens like that so, what that means is, if God is a God of love this much, guess what? He'll still be a God of wrath this much. He'll be a God of uh, the Creator this much. No matter how one attribute may have been only mentioned once in the Bible, or three times in the Bible, or not even mentioned at all, and yet God has revealed himself, those attributes or qualities of God are inseparable. They remain consistent with who God is. So God is love, God is holy, God is powerful, and all those make God one. Number four, when we speak of God, this is a very interesting word, incomprehensibility of God incomprehensibility of God. What do I mean? That God is, we cannot comprehend God in his totality. Meaning, we cannot say, oh, now we understand God fully. And that is exactly where Job found himself. Job felt and thought he understood God fully. And God said, Job, you don't know me. Hold on. That is not me. So, when we say the incomprehensibility of God, we are not saying God cannot be comprehended, meaning we can never understood, understand God. Twofold. On one side, we can never understand God in his totality. However, the much that God reveals himself, he makes us understand to the magnitude of his revelation. So there are certain 
certain attributes of God that we can't reconcile in our mind. And we say, how can a man, how can a being be so loving at the same time with a very equal measure of love, he may also be so judging or so wrathful or his justice. How do you reconcile the two? Because for us human beings, we want to have more of love and less of wrath. So that people understand us and say, no, that man is a loving man. When you talk of wrath, you will never see him get angry. You will never see him get annoyed over certain things. That's how we are as human beings because of our sinful nature. We can't balance our very own characteristics. But with God, that's not the case. He is totally this much as this much. And yet in the much that he reveals about himself, he makes us understand to that measure. And the much that he has not revealed to himself, he says, stop right here. You can't go beyond here. Parents, you can let your visitor or your children know everything they need to know about your house. You give them all the freedom and the liberty to get to know whatever they want to know in your house. But they can never go beyond the bedroom door. They will always arrive at the bedroom door and that's where they stop. We can come to your house, you can tell us everything, you can walk us around your house, but we'll always stop at the bedroom door. You know why? We have no right. We can never press hard on you and say, ah, I'm bedroom pingi de mo, tumo nemo, fish ki abamo. No, you look at us and say, are you out of your mind? This is your limit. God says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to who? To me. This is where you stop. The revealed things are yours. There are times in our Christian faith, we make that sin where God stops for us to know, we don't stop. Guess what we do? We go on the keyhole and are busy trying to peep and see what's inside. And God said, what I've revealed, you will understand it within the measure of that revelation and which we have in his word. So keep those four things in mind. Number one, that these attributes are for the entire Godhead. Number two, that these attributes are permanent. They are not gained and lost. They are just boom on God. And number three, they are inseparable. They don't stand out on their own and functioning on their own. No, they function within the complete nature of God himself. And then uh, fourthly, that God allows us to know him within the measure with which he has revealed himself to us. Now, there's so much that I have here, but let me, run, let me come to a close very quickly. When we come to understand God, and we want to know Him in His totality, which we, of course we want, but we want to know Him to a certain measure from His Word, so that we may develop a, an accurate understanding of who He is. Theologians have come up with systems or methods of trying to understand these qualities of God. And so, or characteristics or uh, attributes of God. And so they would put them in certain brackets. This is the bracket in which God talks about Himself in this way. And this bracket, God talks about himself this way. Now, let me also say this. These methods are human. That's not how the Bible communicates. They simply help us to try and appreciate what's happening in the Bible. So, in Reformed faith, there's a teaching in understanding the doctrines of God that there are two brackets. There are the incommunicable attributes. You've heard that word before. And they are the communicable attributes. Medical personnel, I think those two words are straightforward and also for us. Communicable meaning it can be communicated or it can be related to others. Incommunicable simply meaning they can't be communicated. So 
in that teaching, the idea is that there are these attributes of God that only belong to God. Nobody else can, can have them or they cannot be communicated to God. So, for example, God is eternal. Is that an attribute that God has communicated to any one of us? No. We have a beginning. So that is an incommunicable attribute of God. Another one would be God is present everywhere. Has God communicated to any one of us that attribute? No. Because you and I are what? Present in one place. So that is an incommunicable attribute of God. This is a character of God that only belongs to God. Then there is the section of these very attributes that are also heaped up in one uh, corner. And these are now the communicable, the, 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 the communicable attributes of God. Meaning God has communicated these attributes. For example, he is a God of love. Has God communicated that love to us? Yes. Meaning we are also able to love one another just like God loves. He's a God of mercy. Has God communicated his mercy to us? Yes. Because we also tend to express mercy and forgiveness for one another. He's a God of forgiveness. So those attributes or qualities of God would be called communicable attributes and these others incommunicable attributes. His character that he communicates and his character that he doesn't communicate. Those are all just systems of theology. There are many other others that are there. There are others who have come up with categories of saying the attributes that are just internal in God and there are others that are external of God. What we are doing or what we are going to do in the next uh, five Sundays. We are going to therefore get the attributes that talk about the greatness of God. That God is great. And what is it that we see about God that he says he is great? And those attributes are not going to be these other attributes which would be the acts of God what God has been doing for us to know his greatness. But the attributes that we're going to focus on are not just the acts or the deeds of God to show us the greatness of God, but it is these great attributes of him which are just about his very nature and essence. That's who he is. And this is how great God is in these, with, when we look at these attributes of God. And that will help us understand who God is. And so in these attributes, we are going to look at things like God is personal. God is personal. God is all-powerful. God is eternal. God is spirit. God is everywhere. God is unchangeable in his perfection. And when we see these attributes, at the end of the day, the attributes of God must cause us to fall on our knees and worship him. And worship him. Isn't that what he says in John 4, verse 24? He says, God is spirit. And he doesn't just end there and say, God is spirit. Oh, yeah, yeah, God is spirit, God is spirit. Did you hear God is spirit, God is spirit? And we are done. Okay, it's good to know the greatness of God, God is spirit. No, that's not what John 4, 24 says. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. And what does Jesus follow up with that? Those who are going to worship him must worship him where? In spirit. He doesn't end there. He goes on to say, God is spirit. A time is coming when you will not go to worship God either in the mountain or in the temple at Jerusalem. No, God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he's saying God is not locked up in a geographical place. He is spirit and therefore he's everywhere. And that means you worship him because he sees in the dark as much as he sees in the light. 
He is present with those who are in Canada, USA, Australia, Asia, as much as is present with us. I would love to go into God's Spirit, but we'll keep it for next week. But let me make a point. If you have a wrong view of God being Spirit, and you don't understand the presence of God everywhere in the world, do you know what is going to affect in your theology? It's going to make you pack your bags and go to Nigeria to look for healing. Then you know you have a low view of God. You do not understand the attribute of God, that God is spirit. You are going to pack your bags and go to America and assume, that's where God is. That is an evidence that you have a low view of God. You don't understand the doctrine of God as spirit. Because if you embrace the idea that God is spirit and that spirit is present everywhere, then you know that God is in America as much as he's in Australia. He's in Europe as much as he's in South Africa. And therefore, in all these places, God is as much as he is there as he is here at home in Zambia. If you have a right view of the doctrine that God is spirit, you will, wherever you are, fall on your knees and worship him and establish a relationship with him as much as one who lives in the Antarctica. And that's what I mean. When we begin to embrace these great attributes of God and relate with him in that light, then we will know his great. And then we will know that wherever I am, God is watching me. I cannot do anything in private or in public. He is present there. One child who had a very low view of God and was exposed to the idea that God is spirit and could not comprehend it, and this child said to his Sunday school teacher and said, Is God everywhere? Yes. God is spirit? Yes. Even here, God is there. Yes, God has got you. And he begins to think, oh, well, he has a low view of God. He just doesn't understand. But friends, that's where we need to be. Understanding the character of God. And by that, being able to let that high view of God show itself in our life and our daily lifestyle representing that God is this big. Your children in the home know how big your God is. Because they watch your life. They watch your Bible. They hear what you say about God. And they see how you live. They hear your conversation as you talk with friends. As you talk with your husband. As you talk with your wife. They watch all that and they say, he has a low view of God. If that life talks about that God, then that God is not big. Because the God who is big and the God of my father or my, 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 my mother, I think those are two different gods. Friends, let us develop a high view of God and let our lives show that this God is great and also, God told Job, dress up like a man. Do you know me? Were you there? And Job worshipped God. May the Lord cause us this month to behold this great God and worship him. Amen.